There are several great and unalterable dimensions that show a man's stature. Pain is one of them. It is the most difficult in a series of trials one is accustomed to call life. An examination dealing with pain is no doubt unpopular, yet it is not only revealing in its own right, but it can also shed light on a series of questions preoccupying us at the present. Pain is one of those keys to unlock man's innermost being, as well as the world. Whenever one approaches the points where man proves himself to be equal or superior to pain, one gains hidden access to the sources of his power and the secret hidden behind his dominion. Tell me your relation to pain, and I will tell you who you are. Pain as a measure of man is unalterable, but what can be altered is the way he confronts it. Man's relation to pain changes with every significant shift in fundamental belief. This relation is in no way set, rather, it eludes our knowledge, and yet is the best benchmark by which we discern a race. We can observe this clearly today, since we have a novel and peculiar relation to pain in a world without binding norms. Through examination of this new kind of relation to pain, we now intend to secure an elevated point of surveillance, from which we may be able to catch sight of things still imperceptible on the ground. Our question is, what role does pain play in the new race we have called the Worker that is now making its appearance on the historical stage? Concerning the inner form of this investigation, we are striving for the effect of a bombshell bursting with delayed action, and we promise the attentive reader that he shall not be spared. Let us direct our attention, first of all, toward the peculiar mechanics and economy of pain. The ear becomes anxious when it hears the words pain and mechanics together, and this is because the individual has a desire to situate pain in the realm of chance. In a zone one can avoid and evade, or at the very least, need not be subject to according to the laws of necessity. But if one musters up the inner distance necessary for examination of this object, such as the standpoint of a doctor or a spectator in the galleries watching the gushing blood of gladiators from foreign lands, one soon senses that pain has a sure and ineluctable hold. Nothing is more certain and unavoidable than pain. It resembles life's inescapable shadow, or grist mill grinding the grain ever finer and with ever more incisive rotations. The ineluctability of pain's hold stands out with particular clarity in the observation of smaller processes of life condensed into short time intervals. The insect at our feet, winding its way through the thicket as through the depths of a jungle, seems threatened to an unimaginable degree. Its tiny path resembles a train of terrifying encounters. On both sides it confronts a vast arsenal of obstacles and trenches. And yet this path is but a likeness of our own. Surely we are apt to forget this relation in times of refuge, but we are reminded of it immediately, whenever the elementary zone comes into sight. We are embedded inextricably in this zone, and we cannot evade it through any kind of optical illusion. We feast and stroll like Sinbad the sailor with his wayward followers on the back of an enormous fish he mistakes for an island. The chant Media in Vita springs from a sentiment aware of this threat. We also possess exceptional images of how life is surrounded and engulfed by pain in the impressive paintings of Hieronymus Bosch, Brueghel, and Kronach, whose significance we begin to appreciate again today, and which only a short time ago were considered absurd inventions. These paintings are more modern than one believes, and it is not by accident that technical skill plays such a significant role in them. Many of Bosch's paintings, with their nocturnal conflagrations and infernal flues, resemble industrial landscapes in full operation, and Cranach's Great Inferno on display in Berlin contains a complete array of technical instruments. One of the often recurring motifs is a rolling canopy, with a large, shining knife jutting out of the opening. The sight of such devices evokes a special kind of horror. They are symbols of a mechanically disgusted assault that is colder and more rapacious than any other. Pain's disregard for our system of values greatly increases its hold on life. The Emperor, who, when urged to remove himself from the line of fire, 
responded by asking whether one had ever heard of an emperor falling in battle, exposed himself to one of those errors to which we all too willingly succumb. No human situation is secure against pain. Our children's tales close with passages about heroes who, after having overcome many dangers, live out their lives in peace and happiness. We hear such assurances with pleasure, for it is comforting for us to learn about a place removed from pain. Yet, in truth, life is without any such satisfying end, as is evidenced by the fragmentary character of most great novels, which are either incomplete or crowned by an artificial conclusion. Even Faust closes with this sort of contrived literary device. During times we are apt to call unusual, the indiscriminate nature of this threat is even more apparent. In war, when shells fly past our bodies at high speeds, we sense clearly that no level of intelligence, virtue, or fortitude is strong enough to deflect them, not even by a hair. To the extent this threat increases, doubt concerning the validity of our values forces itself upon us. The mind tends toward a catastrophic interpretation of things, wherever it sees everything called into question. Among the questions of eternal debate is the great clash between the Neptunists and Vulcanists, while the past century, in which the idea of progress predominated, can be characterized as a Neptunistic age, we tend increasingly toward volcanic views. Such a tendency can be seen best in the particular predilections of the mind. A predisposition to a sense of ruin has its proper place here. It has not only conquered broad domains of science, but it also explains the lure of countless sects. Apocalyptic visions spread, historical analysis begins to investigate the potential for a complete collapse to take place internally, through deadly cultural diseases, or externally through the assault of the most foreign and unmerciful forces, such as the colored races. In this connection, the mind feels itself drawn toward the image of powerful empires perishing in their prime. The rapid destruction of the South American cultures forces us to admit that even the greatest civilizations we know are not assured safe development. In such times, the primordial memory of the lost Atlantis recurs. Archaeology is actually a science dedicated to pain. In the layers of the earth, it uncovers empire after empire, of which we no longer even know the names.